Drive for Innovation is pulled into Richardson, Texas, to the home of Enseo, and we're in a very warm, increasingly warm uh, test room with uh, a lot of flat panel displays that are, that are giving off a lot of heat, um, but they're chock full of electronics, and we're with Vanessa Ogle, Good the morning. CEO. How are you? I'm well, thanks. How are you? Good. So you guys have a very interesting story, uh, how this company started and how you got to where you are today. Walk us through that. Well, in 2000, uh, we were working with another company called 3DFX Interactive, which was a publicly traded Silicon Valley private equity funded company out of uh, California. And they decided they wanted to be an entertainment company, not a technology company. And so we thought maybe we would do better on our own. And so I started in SEO and then uh, negotiated a buyout with all of the employees and assets and intellectual property rights and agreements that were previously with STV Systems and then 3DFX, and we brought them all into Enseo. So, piece of cake, no problem. You, you can do that <laughs> in your sleep. Wait, wait, wait. So you, you bought this company out, you created a new company. Yes. Uh, that's not that easy. Had no. No, it wasn't easy at all. In fact, well, one of the things that was difficult is that the company that we did the buyout from, 3DFX, kept changing chairmen on the board of directors. Oh, so every time I would meet with the board of directors and pitch why they should let me do this, because of course I didn't have any money. And so part of the pitch was, well let me take the company out, I'll give you stock, which will become worth lots of money later on, um, you'll give me a loan to be able to continue operating, and then it'll be great. And so every time we'd almost get the deal done, the chairman would leave, and then we'd get another CEO, or then the CEO would leave, and then so it took us about six iterations to actually finalize the transaction. This was, you said this was in 2000? Yes. Okay. What were you doing at 3DFX at the time? Um, I was the general manager of their specialized technology group. So I was a division that I ran. So it's 2000, just when the internet bubble is bursting or about to burst. Yes. And you well, want right to go. Before it burst. Yeah, right before it burst. <laughs> and you want to go out on your own. Yes. Okay. What possessed you to do that? Well. I had a team at the division that I was working, that I was running, that was this just incredibly innovative and dynamic team. And they were excited about continuing to innovate and create products that were innovative and new products and, and industry leading products. And the company that owned us was really more focused on street valuation and stock price and being a big name, household name. And so it wasn't a very good fit anymore. And so to continue having fun, we really thought that we needed to, to do it separately. So w when you finally pinned the chairman down and finally did the deal and the paper, the ink was drying on the, on the, on the papers, yes. you knew you were going to go forward yes. with, with Enseo. Right. Were you terrified, uh, energized, combination of both? Gosh, I wasn't, I don't think I was, um, if I'd known what was coming, I would have been terrified. I didn't know enough about what was coming. I didn't have enough wisdom to be terrified. I was all excitement and, um, and, and just passion to get it done. My next focus after I got the company agreed to do it was actually to convince the employees to come with me. Um, because I had employees who were employed by this, you know, half a billion dollar corporation with nice cushy jobs and, you know, 401k packages and, you know, oh, come on, it's going to be fun. We're going to have a lot more fun if we go off and start a new company. So that was, you know, my next challenge. And so then I had to convince the customers that they should stay with us, even though now we weren't part of a big company and we were this standalone little bitty tiny company. And how did you how did you do that? Because the, you know customers don't want a lot of risk, right? They and, do uh, not like risk. And suddenly, the the landscape has shifted on them. Well, one of the things you know the benefits of where we were corporately was that what we were offering to the customers really was leading edge technology. So that there wasn't a lot of competition. They couldn't have gotten it in a lot of other places. They designed their products around our our, our what we were doing. And I went to the team. Um, at the TV Guide company, actually, oh, um, yeah. which is Gemstar now, yeah. and then now it's Rovi. Um, and I went to that team uh, in Tulsa and I said, well, we're not getting a lot of support and funding to continue moving this program forward. I'd like to keep doing it. If I can keep the same engineering team and I can keep all of our intellectual property rights, would you stay with me for me to do this program separately as a separate standalone company? And they were they got they had a meeting and they got together and they they said yes they would and so that was our first year's worth of revenue. Wow! So this was ten years ago. Um, yes. So you were a lot younger than you are now, and you're pretty <laughs> young right now. I, I was think twelve years younger. Yeah. yeah. 
So um, did that, so how old were you in 2000, if you don't mind me asking? Um, why my math's not that great. Uh, I was 29. 29. And so did that, did, did age, I, you know, in... in a age in made a huge difference. It did. Um, yeah, we have some really funny stories. The first couple of uh, trade shows that we had, um, you know, we were so excited to be a standalone company and to have a new name. And we had, of course, we'd gone through, we had a, a name of the company, we had a logo for the company. Um, we, we had products already, so that wasn't new, but just as a standalone entity and showed up at the trade show booths. And we all do everything. Everybody at the company just pitches in and does whatever right. needs to be done. So there were several times when um, people came up to the trade show booth and um, there was one editor in particular from a technical magazine who shall not be named who came up and said, uh, you know, I'd like to meet with somebody from the company. I was like, great. Um, well, what are you looking for? How can I help you? And he goes, well, I really need to talk to somebody who knows what they're talking about. And I'm like, okay, I understand that. Oops. Why don't you let me know what you're looking for and I'll see if I can find somebody that can help you. And he said, I don't think you understand. I need to talk to someone who can make a decision. And I looked at him like, well, I just made one. And what I've decided is that no matter what you have to sell, we're really today not interested. Um, but that happened over and over and over again in meetings. My team started getting a really big kick out of it. And they'd almost set it up in a way. And we'd have big boardrooms worth of people. And I'd come in and you know, typically look around, because they're all guys. And not thinking about hospitality very nicely. And I said, does anybody need coffee? Does anybody need water? And, and sure enough, the conversation would continue on and I'd get coffee and water. And, and there would be some really interesting comments as I would you know, deliver coffee and water and sit down at the table. And they'd look at me like, what are you doing here? And what, aren't, you gonna, aren't we waiting for the CEO? When is the CEO going to arrive? I'm like, guys, let's go. We're here to have a meeting. Let's have the meeting. So it, you know, it was really fun. Um, but it made it, it was an adventure, but it made a big difference. Um, now, walking into a trade show or walking into a room of executives, and unfortunately, I can't hide anymore. Yeah. Um, I can't pretend to be the girl just delivering right, the coffee. Right. Um, and um, it sure makes getting business done a lot easier. Yep. Okay, so let's talk about technology. First of all, what's the origin of the company's name, Enseo? Um, Enseo comes from the Latin of to think and to do. And so the Latin for to think is sen seo. Um, thinking by itself doesn't really do anything for products or for shareholder equity. So you have to think and do. And so we kind of mushed it together until the website was available and we could get the copyrights on it. And Works for me. There you have it. Okay, so um, so this is uh, an Enseo box. It is, a, that's an HD 3000. Okay, um, and these things um, basically go on the back of these things. Tell yes. us about the technology and, uh, and what you guys do. This is um, a digital media player or a set back box or a set top box that um, has a series of microprocessors inside of it and those microprocessors allow us to do, to provide the video that people see um, today on screens. And so we provide this typically in commercial environments, whether that's, we've done this in um, 450,000 hotel rooms over the last couple of years, uh, lots of stadiums and arenas, retail, big box retail, um, digital signage. So you're making uh, our on the road experience a lot better because most uh, TVs in most <laughs> hotels are just frustrating. They're, they're awful. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that's hard about the TV experience um, is you, you know, people, first of all, they have a flat panel TV, so it's a bigger piece of glass but you still have bad signals coming in, and so now you have just bigger, uglier, bad signals on that piece right. of glass. Right. Um, or they do a great job and they actually bring in HD programming for you, but then they don't tell you where the programs are, so you really just want to watch ESPN. And you change the channel and it takes you a few seconds to change the channel, and then guess what? You still don't know what channel you're on because there's a commercial. Yep. So we're integrating not just the technology of displaying um, the screen of the high definition video, but also the user interface of making sure that you always know what channel you're on when you change the channel, making sure that you have an interactive program guide. Um, every single room that you stay in, you can just hit one button and know where all the channels are. So what's your competitive advantage? Um, there are a lot of people all around the world that, that make this or, or could make this. Sure. What's your secret sauce? Well, we teased, I was in a meeting a couple of uh, years ago and someone said, well, why, why can't I go buy a cheap Chinese set-top box? And I said, well, what do you think you're buying? <laughs> you're still buying. I build these products in China. 
Um, but number one, we're making sure that we have quality of components so that it actually gives a repeatable experience. Um, and then two, the way that we're putting it together is a little bit different than the way most people are focusing on. Um, right now, everything's focused on digital technology and everything's focused on IPTV. And we have still a lot of installations in the world that have lots of great coax cabling. Right. And there's no reason to throw away that coax cabling. It's great. Copper does wonderful things. And so our, our really claim to fame is that we're allowing the distribution of video and audio signals regardless of the infrastructure that you have in a building. So if it's a new building, if it's an old building, if it has network cable, if it has coax cable, if you have cable coming in, if you have satellite coming in, we really abstract all of that from the user. So all you have to see as a guest in a hotel room is, I know that CNN is on Channel 5. Right, right. You don't want to care about any of the rest of it. So you guys are doing hardware design as well as software design here? Yes, we are. Um, on Even though we sell what we tease as our ugly black boxes, um, of every product that we sell, it, it, it's probably at least 75% software engineering into every product. What's your biggest challenge today uh, in terms of engineering the next generation products? In the technology company um, that we're in, in the space that we're in, the biggest challenge is consistently choosing the right technology. There's always latest, greatest technology. Um, we're very lucky in the fact that we continue to get access to great silicon from great manufacturers. Not a lot of smaller companies do. Um, and so now that we have access to all those great pieces of silicon, we actually have limited resources, as any kind of company does. But with limited resources, what is the technology that we're going to put our resources behind to say, this is what people need next? And so making that choice um, is what we do really well. And sometimes the right choice is, even though we tried it and we took a product to look at, is saying, no, that's not the right technology. We're going to put that on the shelf and wait and, and focus on another technology that's more mainstream right now. From the, from the hardware standpoint, is there, do you have a lot of custom components on here, SOCs and ASICs, or is it mostly off the shelf? And mostly off the shelf. Um, we do have um, a few programmable devices in there, and so we have our secret sauce inside those boxes. But for the most part, we're using industry available and industry standard silicon and just putting them together in a little bit different way. So you manufacture these overseas, which suggests to me that, that you're pumping out high volumes of stuff. As, as we've gone across the country, sure. one of my biases was electronics manufacturing is dead in the United States. Turns out it's quite, quite the opposite. I agreed. Regardless of what region you're in. But most of those... Uh, companies, and there are a lot of them, um, are not the, ever going to be the Foxcons of the world, right? Right. They're, they're, they're not going to operate at that level, and, mm -hmm. and probably because they don't want to. But at, at small to, to medium volumes, mm -hmm. um, they're, they're quite competitive, and they're getting more and more competitive at higher and higher volumes. What, why do you guys manufacture overseas? Are there any challenges there for you? Yes. <laughs> yes, there are challenges for us. Um, well, we're atypically lucky in that our CTO is, uh, he speaks Mandarin Chinese fluently. And so that gives us a huge edge in being able to communicate with um, the foreign manufacturers. Um, we also have an edge in that our distribution partner that we use to buy most of our components that goes into these really supported our interest in manufacturing where we did. And so they supported us in shipping product directly overseas. Even though we bought the components here, um, they actually shipped the product directly to us to the holding uh, teams in Asia. So let's go back and ask you one more question about you. Sure. You've been doing this for 12 years. Yes. Um, what's, what's next? You get well, tired of it? Um, no, I'm not getting tired of it. Um, well, then the last time somebody asked me that was a couple of years ago, and I said, well, the next title I wanted was to have was mom. But I am now okay. a mom. I have two young daughters. Um, they're five and two. And we have a nursery upstairs. And so they're here with me during the day, most of the days, and they travel with me. We just got back um, on a trip from, uh, from Atlanta together. And so they travel with me quite a bit. Um, the next level for me is gonna be, you know, they're going into school age now. Yep. So I'm gonna have to grow the company to such a level that I can still continue to spend time with the girls while they're in school. So I'll have to uh, change how I do business and how I manage the team and how I manage the customer base so that I can be more home-based and not be the one jetting around all over the world um, dealing with all those details. That's a hell of a challenge. It is a challenge. Did it you, is. Did you um, have long conversations with yourself 
before <laughs> your first child as to how you were going to make that that balance and make it work, or you, you just said, I'll figure it out? Well, no, I had long conversations because it took me a long time to, to have them. So I had them quite late in life and really thought about what were we going to do and how, how was I going to make that work. And I had a lot of talk with the team here at Enseo. Um, you look, this is going to be a big change for all of us. Are you guys you know, really okay with this or do we need to start looking for someone else to kind of lead the team? And they were very emphatic and supportive of, um, of, of supporting me having the girls and having them here at the office. So, you know, we, they, they, they're known by the staff. They, they play here at the office. Um, you know, it, the team has been amazing in really integrating the girls into our office environment and even my customers. You know, they, you know we were at a, a hotel conference not too long ago and the CTO of Marriott walks up um, to the person who was watching the girls and said, hi, Sophia, hi, Ariana. And she's like, hi, Neil. And I mean, you know, they're known in the industry. Wow, that's a great story. It's and um, are they um, programming yet? They are not programming yet, but they are, um, they think that they're responsible for handing out our profit sharing bonuses. So um, they walk around and hand out the checks. We have profit sharing checks with me and um, It's a good they, thing to teach. Yeah, it's good. Although my, um, my, my older daughter, Sophia, um, the first time she was allowed to talk about bonuses, I was not with her. But she walked around engineering with um, Star Wars questionnaires, which for engineers is like gold, right? Yeah. I mean, they yeah, know yeah. everything about Star Wars. She thought she knew everything about Star Wars, and she was grading how much of a bonus they were going to get as to how accurately they answered the Star Wars questions. So um, That metric is as good as any. Uh, it was pretty good. Cool. It was pretty good. Well, thanks so much. Oh.